What's up, SDS Nation, and welcome to another episode of Surviving the Survivor, the podcast that promises to bring you the very best guests in all of true crime. Took us a little bit today to get on the air, but that's because you've got the OG of true crime, Dennis Murphy from Dateline, and uh, we are going to get into how the sausage is made. Oh, uh, Dateline. Yes. <laughs> Dateline is the number one true crime show in America, and Dennis has been a part of it for many, many years. So we will hear all about that, and we'll also hear uh, why they chose to do not one, but two episodes on the Dan Markell murder case. Of course, our best guess, it goes without saying, Dennis Murphy is the winner of four national Emmys for excellence in news reporting, possibly more since... Uh, I picked up that bit of information. He is best known for regular contributions to NBC News, NBC Nightly News, Dateline NBC, The Today Show, and NBC News at Sunrise. He's covered the Dan Markell murder case from the beginning. He is now a contributor to Dateline NBC, officially retiring from the network, but still working on select episodes. And then, of course, the other face is very familiar to our audience, she is the great Ruth Markell, the author of the widely discussed book about her son's murder, The Unveiling, A Mother's Reflection on Murder, Grief, and Trial Life. Prior to writing that, Ruth was already a noted author, public speaker, and the president of RNM Enterprises, a leading management consulting firm. And she's been on the other side of the camera, appearing on 2020, Inside Edition, Court TV, and of course, Dateline NBC. So, Thank you both uh, for joining. I uh, really appreciate it. Uh, quick programming note. Uh, we will be live tomorrow once again on the Dan Markell murder case. Uh, a former JAG attorney, uh, Carl Steinbeck, has put together over 125 reasons why he believes Wendy Adelson will be indicted one day uh, for this crime. And uh, we got through about 25 of those uh, points on the last show, I believe, and we're picking up where we left off. So please join us Join us tomorrow night, 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. We're at Podcast STS. Please become a YouTube member. Shout out to Sunny M, who just did that, became a YouTube member, as well as supporting us on Patreon. Uh, Dennis, to you, this is a uh, a lot of fun for me personally, which I hate that expression. It's uh, <laughs> redundant. Should never use that expression, me personally, but I just did. Um, I'm a, a news guy. Spent 20, I actually started as an NBC page back oh in goodness. 1995. So it's been a little while. But uh, tell us, how did you start in journalism? And how did you wind your way into Dateline, one of the coveted shows on the network? I started journalism, though it was hardly that, at the uh, local CBS station in New York, WCBS. I was just out of college, and you know what they make you do? Go get coffee for people, put toner into the Xerox machine. You'll have to Google it, look it up to see what that technology <laughs> was. But I, I sort of rode side saddle with some really good people in New York. And, you know, what, what are the choices at that point? You go to Columbia J School, I guess, if you're lucky. But I decided to just jump in, and I got some mentors and... Uh, off I went into local newsland. I was in Houston for a while, Seattle for many years, and then NBC picked me up. And uh, I've got to squint now to remember when I wasn't doing it. <laughs> and uh, are you from New York originally, from the area? I used to climb the tree in our yard in New Jersey and look at the Empire State Building. I guess I was checking to see if King Kong was still around. But I was a, I was a northern Jersey kid. But I think I always thought and still do think that New York City is the belly button of the universe. I'm sorry. It's just the way I am. And uh, I always wanted to go there and work. And I'm glad I did. And I'm glad I'm not there now. I live in Florida. But, uh, you know, it was a, I've had a tremendous ride. I'm about to be 76 in the two days. And you look fantastic. Happy birthday to you. I can tell you that uh, one day I quietly stalked you. I saw you walking across the street somewhere in midtown Manhattan. Oh. I was at Fox five for a while. And I said, one day I'm going to be like Dennis Murphy. I'm, oh I'm going to be on Dateline. And you know what? That one day never happened. Made it up to Fox news channel and uh, doing this now. But uh, Dennis made it to the very, very, uh, upper echelons of the business. So uh, again, it is a, it's a thrill for me to have him on and a thrill to have Ruth on Ruth. Um, you obviously met Dennis 
uh, under inauspicious circumstances. Um, but how did you two uh, get to know each other? Obviously through the Dateline episode, but when, when was the first time uh, Dennis reached out and how did it all, how did it all go for you? First of all, I want to thank you, Joel, for having Dennis on. Uh, Dennis has been a major player in the Dateline uh, program. I've had uh, three interviews with uh, David. Yeah, yeah. Yes, we did three. We, we just taped the show recently. And uh, happy birthday, Dennis. Let thank me, you, Ruth. Uh, thank just you. to say that. And uh, yes, yeah, so our introduction really goes back quite a few years ago, uh, just really after the arrests in the case and uh, when they were starting up the breakthroughs. And, uh, and we did the first show, I believe it was 2018. And uh, following that, there was a show in 2019 after Garcia's um, a trial and uh, Catherine McBanois' mistrial, which we did never forgot. And, uh, and we've already just met with Dennis. Uh, actually, this is the first time uh, in the fall, not, not in the person, but by Zoom. But it's always our pleasure, and Dennis has been a great support and Dateline, of course, uh, to the family and the Don Markel story. Ruth, and your, your, your book is so amazing, and I, I realize now with a little bit of shame that it's been my job to be one of those people w with the cameras and the recorders pushing them in your face as you're walking into a courtroom or on your way to a, to a car. And I realize th that you've been sentenced to this macabre kind of red carpet event where you're always going past people like me and they're shouting these awful journalistic questions the tabloid questions how do you feel about that ruth how do you feel that your son was murdered ruth how do you feel when the law enforcement told you that members of the in-laws are likely the architects of this crime i'm, I'm embarrassed about that ruth that, that we're always out there picking and uh but, and Den uh, Dennis, you bring up a good point. I mean, how do you negotiate that? Because on the one hand, Dateline is this unbelievable franchise, really the the pioneer in true crime, um, and it is entertainment. But on the other hand, you are dealing with real people's lives, real law. So how how do you negotiate that as a correspondent, once a correspondent, now a contributor for this high profile show? Well, I've always been aware of it, Joel. You know that we're also selling uh, stomach remedies and commercials in between these stories where we're dealing with the, the worst thing that's ever happened to a family in, in their life. And it's, be, let's face it, we're, we're selling it as entertainment in a way or instructive television. Uh, Ruth and Phil were very, very kind to us. We worked through the lawyers, as, which made great sense to us. I think we communicated by emails and whatever. But we didn't want to do that how are you feeling today? What do you make of this? The shouted question. Um, that would only poison relationships when things were over. And and Ruth and and Phil said, "Look, we'll talk to you guys when it's all over, but don't don't hound us in the hallways. Don't hound us on the way to the car." So we try and honor that. We we always want to have a very good relationship with the families involved in these things. I just want to say something also that I have to compliment. In general, actually, the journalists and the media have that sensitivity. I think part of their training is to recognize that the, the families are really in distress and everything else. And I have to say, this is a case that everybody knows. It has glamour and glitz. And, you know, homicide doesn't discriminate and everybody's interested in true crime. But their victims are there. So I think the more sensitivity uh, that we can get from the journalist support, which we've had, uh, certainly with Dateline and all the others, uh, it's always welcome. Um, and right on cue, Dennis was talking about uh, selling uh, stomach remedies. And Raul Thomas writes, Donna may have to allocate her entire canteen money to Pepto, <laughs> followed by will Teflon Donna uh, ever get arrested, followed here by hope Wendy gets indicted. So uh, the Dan Markell crew is in uh, full force here. I knew I liked Dennis because Dennis, I'm – also a Jersey guy. Yeah. I would keep my hat here. I'm from Highland Park, New Jersey, which is a uh, stone's throw from Rutgers. So ho uh, hocus, ho hocus, New Jersey, Joel, H O H O K U S. I know, I, I know, with Highlands. I know the name. Well, I know the name. Well, so happy to have you here once again. I'm um, so Dennis, I mean, I can tell you firsthand uh, when I was an NBC page, it was the first ever 
Rosie O'Donnell show and it was in the Saturday night live studio and they could not fill the audience. So I had to run out and get creative as a page and I pulled over two bus fulls of tourists from Tokyo. So her first show, her pilot, if you look closely at the audience, um, had two bus loads of Tokyo tourists. Um, Never in my wildest dreams, I ended up as an investigative reporter for Fox uh, 5 in New York and then went on to Fox News Channel. But you, did you ever plan or intend on becoming a kind of a true crime correspondent? I know you said you did the local uh, news circuit, which a lot of us do. Or was this sort of serendipitous uh, in nature that you wound up here in this world? I did the usual pinballing, Joel, where you do everything. I was based in London for a while and... Mm. Uh, at that time, uh, the, the, we did one of two stories. Either the Soviet Union was falling apart or the royal marriage was falling apart. <laughs> so we would toggle, toggle between those stories. But no, I did the fires, floods, assassinations, all the, the mayor's news conferences, all of those kinds of things that you do. Uh, but when we, I got sent back to New York, they said, do you want to be part of this magazine show? We're going to invent it as we go, ad- go along. In the beginning, it was, it was meant to be like 2020 or 60 minutes. It would be three segments and... Uh, Maybe one of them would be crime, but my partner and I started to special at the time there was it was the era of great trials. OJ had happened and there was the court TV channel and we had a relationship with them and we started taking their material and telling them the stories. You know, what would you how would you do this? Not in a tr- traditional AP kind of lead, but let me tell you a story. Once upon a time, there was, you know, uh, uh, something happened and, and it turned out to be a, the audiences went for them. And after a while, there was there were fewer segments uh, and it was one hour shows and then two hour shows. Ruth, I think our last show was two, two hours. All our shows have been two hours, yes. So, I mean, there, we found that there was an audience for it and we became sort of the lead vehicle in the uh, true crime industrial complex. Uh, and, and how competitive is it between you and 2020, obviously the other big leader at ABC? Well, I don't bump into them in the field all that much. We seem to run into 48 hours more than the other guys. But mm. uh, I, I mean, we're all doing the same kind of thing. We're not trying to play games and uh, yank away interviews or do any kind of foolish tricks. Uh, it, it seems to work out. It, 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 I've never found there to be a traffic jam on a story. Though often we do the same things. What I don't like is when I do a story uh, and, and you read the comments afterwards and it says, Oh, we saw this. They said it was going to be a new story and it's a repeat. Well, it was new to me because I didn't do it, but it was somebody 48 hours had done it six months before. So you get a lot of that kind of sniping. Yeah. Uh, Jimmy C writes, uh, the Adelsons will all be charged in the fall. Bold statement. The eve of Charlie's trial. We'll get into that in a little bit. Followed here by Rebecca Martin. Justice for the family of Dan Markell. May his memory be a blessing. So Dennis, um, You've got one hour episodes, two hour episodes. What makes a two hour episode over a one hour episode? Well, frankly, a lot of times you think, well, we've got an hour 20 worth of story to tell, Mm -hmm. but we don't want to squeeze it down into 58 minutes or whatever. So we try and we know without running the popcorn machine too much and the cotton candy, we want to tell the story, but just let it breathe a little bit. And I think it works most of the time. Sometimes it outstays its welcome. But uh, you'd be surprised at how easily the two-hour shows go down. I, I recoiled in horror the first time they said, all right, uh, that story that you just showed us in the screening here was a one-hour show. Make it two hours and go back in two weeks and show us that version of it. And that's, that's what happened. It was experiment, what worked and what didn't work. But, uh, yeah, I mean, Dateline, I think someone, someone told me a factoid once, I guess in our publicity department, that there are... 90 hours of Dateline on an American TV every week. Mm. I wouldn't encourage anyone to walk it, but there's so much of it in syndication reruns. Uh, There's a station in LA plays at 11 o'clock in the morning. I mean, it is out there. So I I don't know what we found, but we had good luck in, in, in telling the stories, but it goes back to courtesy with, I mean, we have to be, if it's Ruth in, in, in our chair or, somebody else from another story we just have to be very mindful that this is the worst experience of their life they're talking about ruth um, i mean you i'm struck you say you're sentenced to sort of live this perpetual punishment now it's very very hard i think that uh one of the things with so much glitz and glamour as this story has 
Uh, you know, we, we have the faith healers, we have uh, oh. boob jobs, plastic surgery, but behind it all, there's a family that's really suffering. And we're also, it, what's really difficult is people don't recognize that you're not just suffering from the loss and the murder of Dan, which was horrific, but going through the criminal system is like a roller coaster. And, uh, you know, I use all these, these play, playground terms. It's either a seesaw, a roller coaster. Every, every few times you think you're having a uh, trial, there's a continuance. And then if there's not a continuance, there's an appeal. And a lot of this is not seen in the public because they don't get all of the, uh, the motions and everything else about that. So uh, we are really always behind the scenes. Uh, and I have to say the word suffering. And I, and I think the public has to know that because the, um, especially in this case, there is the glamour, there is the glitz, there is the profile. Uh, there has been, and, I, and we're privileged. You know, we have social media supporting us, Justice for Dead. We've been on all of the shows, uh, Dateline and uh, Say Your Competitors as well, uh, 2020 and a whole host of podcasts. So this is really a, um, you know, a very important part of the media. And actually, I put a whole section of the media in my book. Mm -hmm. I think we have to really talk about uh, the experience with the media. We're not in the Constitution. But as you know, Ruth, it becomes part of the equation. You have to deal with us. You know, collectively, I represent, you know, the, the media. Uh, we're, we're there. We are the people in the hallway with the cameras. We're the ones that want to know one thing extra that the other guys don't have. Um, you know, I, I, I was struck by one thing, Ruth, when, I was, when you were introducing Dan in the first pages of your book. I thought you left out maybe one word after a comma. He's, he is a father. He is a son. He is a brother, scholar, admired by so many people. I think there was another comma. He was, he was a godly man. He lived his faith. He was an observant man. And he, I think that's what makes it such an egregious crime. He wasn't just the ordinary guy. Yeah. No, he had very, very strong, strong identity, uh, certainly uh, with the Jewish religion, a feeling. It's a feeling and a knowledge, uh, not so much always the practice. But I also want to say, once you brought up Dan, I was going to bring it up later, but a lot of the credit for the media actually goes to Dan. And we, we really should never forget that he was internationally acclaimed. And from the day of his murder, which was horrific, it's, there's been memorials all over the world. And, and there has been a lot of print, like so the, the, let's call it the TV media and some of the others came in a little bit later, but the, from day one, everybody was really following the story, you know, from the New York Times, the Wall Street mm -hmm. Journal, all of uh, the other kinds of publications. So I think that Dan set the stage really in his own way for this, uh, which we're grateful for this considerable media following. And Ruth, was it like that in the beginning uh, when this first happened back in 2014? Did you find yourself, and by the way, we've got Lizzie Bell saying, oh, Ruth is looking so lovely, Thank followed you. by Go Georgia, <laughs> reference to <laughs> Prosecutor Kaplan. Ruth, you are beaming, looking beautiful, followed by JPJ. Welcome, beautiful <laughs> Ruth. So you know that these people have been following the case closely and of course, let us not forget this one here to the brave and strong uh, Ruth Markell. But in the very beginning, Ruth, I mean, I'm sure local media was on this, but was there any point where you felt you had to reach out to the media to get some extra push and extra help because the case went unsolved for some time? Well, I'll give you a little bit about the history uh, of how we were involved with the media. At the very beginning, actually, we, we did not have to pursue the media. They came right to us. And um, in fact, while we were sitting Shiva, uh, one of the news um, uh, companies actually sent us uh, some flowers uh, just to start to engage. They knew it was going to be a big story, the media. So we, um, and we never, Phil and I and the rest of the family, we never went public. That's my description mm. for going to the media, for addressing the media. The only time we started to do that was actually after um, the arrests, and we and we had this this already built up relationship with the media, that we went in and utilized it to help us with the grandparent story, and the media was great. They picked it up on many many levels, and we did a lot of interviews about it. So we have had a very good relationship and a and a really 
great history uh, with the media. That's that's absolutely right from our side as well, Ruth. And uh, Jen Henry writes, honestly, who feels like they personally know Dennis after watching him all these years? Uh, we do, I guess. I, I, I think I read it the wrong way. But Dennis, my point is, uh, people do feel like they know you when you're out and about now in Florida. Do you get people coming up to you in the supermarket and saying, how are you doing, Dennis? And you have no idea who they are just because you're such a familiar face to so many. Yeah, you get a little bit of that. Most people are confused. They think, are you my insurance guy or did you tell me a Ford a few years ago? It's not. <laughs> Keith, the, the wonderful Keith Morrison would not go through that. But I think I'm, you know, I'm a face. They, they say, why do I know you more than anything else? But yeah, it's been a long run. Been out there. And uh, my, you brought my best moment on, on that. I was going to my. Uh, to my Home Depot, and the greeter at the door said, "Has anybody ever told you you look just like Dennis Murphy?" <laughs> <laughs> and not, usually, they get, as we used to say, the right church, wrong pew. They'd say, "Are you, are you that sixty minutes guy?" They used, to, they used to think I was Steve Croft, but Steve. you know, the the Home Depot receptionist got it in one. I love it. You're more handsome than Steve Croft. Keith Morrison. <laughs> Keith Morrison is arguably the sexiest man in America. How is your relationship with Keith and Josh? I love those two guys. We don't get together near enough. Uh, I mean, Keith, as they say, could read the phone book and you'd follow. And he, I think he's put up a video of himself doing just that. But we get along really, really well. The only time we see each other anymore, none of us are traveling as much as we used to, of course, because of the plague. But uh, uh, we see each other at these crime conference, uh, uh -huh. crime con, they call it, I think, in the summertime. And maybe one trip through New York where they'll, they'll bring us all through. But they are the best guys. What you see is what you get. I, I think I, Keith is Canadian, if I remember correctly. He, he is. He was in the wilds of Saskatchewan, Ruth, with, with the local radio stations. Yeah. Spinning so what, the discs and reading the news. One <laughs> of the things that's incredibly difficult about TV news and TV shows that I don't know that the you know, the general public is quite as aware of is the economy of words, being able to tell a story in a short amount of time. So Dennis, I'm going to put you on the spot here. I, I need an honest answer. Who is the best writer amongst you, Keith and Josh? And don't be humble. Keith. Keith is the best writer for television. Is he? Yeah. What What makes him so good? Because you listen to Keith Morrison. I could, I could go to, to sleep and I mean that in a good way. He's just uh, so comforting, even though he's talking about death and murder. Um, I, I would even put my three children to sleep to Keith Morrison, I think, because he's just he's such a comforting voice. But what makes him such a tremendous TV writer? Because he has an attitude towards the story, Joel. He has this kind of step back thing where he could write if he wanted to the conventional Associated Press lead and you'd be bored. But he has this kind of air about him of floating above the valley and oh, what fools these mortals be. Let me tell you a story of this one particular thing. Uh I, I just think he's very relatable, and he's got a pipe organ voice that can hit all the notes. And he doesn't put that on. People think he's doing Keith Morrison like uh, Bill Hader from Saturday Night Live. That's not that is that is who Keith is. When you're sitting, you know, having a glass of wine with him, it's the same guy. He's uh, he's a different a different era, and just an amazing an amazing talent. Um, that I hope not, everyone and not to shortchange Josh. Josh is a wonderful writer, and he has a style. He knows what works for him. Uh, we all I, I, I kind of I'm kind of an old school news guy. I write an American slang. I think I write an elevated American slang. Uh, but what tr makes me nuts about television news lately, and I can barely watch the evening news on any of them. The lead of every story is tonight. Mm -hmm. And then there'll be a gerund tonight. People running in the halls of Congress. Uh, you, you don't ever hit a verb or a subject. It's, it's just a run on collection of ING words. And, and it makes me nuts. I want to get to that, how the media landscape has changed. But, Ruth, I want to ask you, um, obviously, the Dan Markell uh, murder and the entire – all the trials surrounding it and the impending trials become, uh, you know, huge, uh, very high profile. Is that problematic for you ever that it becomes so high profile? In general, it's not problematic. I think in some ways it gives, you know, us a chance that we – that the media is watching and a lot of people – uh, who are working in law enforcement and certainly in the prosecutor's office and so forth, are really uh, know that it's, it's high profile. Uh, I think I would say that right now for the very first time, uh, and most uh, maybe your viewers know this or they don't remember it, but, you know, we're dealing with a continuance. We're dealing with uh, the, whole, the whole issue of, of Catherine's proffer. 
And for the first time ever, the issue of uh, the public knowing is sort of concerning because of the fact that they're worried about, will they get enough jurors? So mm. this, this is really just a very current phenomena. It's never really happened before. And um, and I would say that I hope it uh, is not is not uh, continuous in any kind of a way, but uh, but this is the first time where like one would say that the profile of the case has some concerns in uh, will there be enough jur jurors to to find to scout and not to be too contaminated by what's going on outside on the outside. Ruth, I should know, but I don't. Is the trial date set for Charlie Adelson? Is it still? No, it's we, we were just continued, right? I love this word continued. It's postponed. To me, continued should be it was canceled. But the point, the point, talk about words. There's a word that drives me crazy. But um, we just had a, and uh, just a little while ago on uh, February 28th, I'm not sure if you're aware. So there was actually a, um, a case management. And at that time, it was decided that uh, Charlie's trial will not be happening April 24th, but it will be happening sometime where we don't have what the sometime is, mm -hmm. anywhere around September, October, but we don't have an answer yet. And Ruth, how difficult is, is the wait? The wait is terrible. The wait, the uncertainty is really, I think, the hardest part you're, because you're already traumatized just from the loss. But this lifestyle is very, very hard. Uh, Jimmy C writes, uh, became a YouTube member. Thank you, Jimmy C. You are a fan, uh, a friend of the show. Thank you. Appreciate that. Fancy <laughs> fiction. Dennis, I don't know <clears throat> if you know Fancy, but Ruth definitely knows Fancy. Fancy is my best friend, Fancy. Oh, uh, you know, <laughs> which I did, so, but I don't. So Fancy is a new breed of journalist. She uh, it has a YouTube channel, uh, not unlike myself, and she gets all the wiretaps um, and a lot of other uh, insider information. Uh, and she has followed this case and probably knows it. No offense to anyone better than just about anyone except maybe Ruth. Um, and she writes, looking good, Ruth, looking good. There's also, uh, I need to give a shout out to Asian American Legal Focus. Yes. Same story there. And Mentor Lawyer, Mentor, M-E-N-T-O-U-R. Uh, they all followed this case way before I ever followed this case. My question to you, as the landscape changes, is Dateline adapting? Are you now, uh, I know you're interviewing podcasters, but do you think your producers are scouring through people like Fancy Fiction's YouTube channel to see if they can get uh, information that can be relevant to producing a show? Dateline and NBC are major players in podcasting. I think on the Apple list, they're one, two, three this week. Uh Keith is don't rub it in, there. Dennis. Don't rub it in. Josh, I'm trying to catch him. Josh, Josh has got one, so they're very active in it. They realize that we can't be uh, see, assuming that everybody's going to be sitting politely on a Friday night to watch us on a whole TV screen. Uh, I, it's happening. The, the, the devices are out there. There are different places. People are. Some people like podcasts uh, more than the show. Every show we do is then put in a podcast form the next day. It's available as a podcast. So. Uh, I, I I'm all for the uh, I'm all for the young people doing whatever they can to open up all kick open all the fire doors. I and just want to say something, and I want to add to that. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the whole group, uh, like you just you just men mentioned, and your show and uh, surviving the survivor. They're very very important, and I do want to say uh, Dennis is the front stage of the show, but Brad Davis, who's the producer. Oh. I'm glad Brad you mentioned them, Ruth. Yep. Yeah, Brad is on it. I mean, I'm in touch with Brad, and Brad is comes to the trials, and Brad checks behind the scenes and, and so forth. So they know what's going on. And, um, you know, and Justice for Dan, I want to also say, uh, Justice for Dan on social media is also watched a lot by all of the formal media players and, and the podcasts. And we also have to say that, we had a very successful podcast with Wondery over my dead body, which I don't know if you know this, Dennis, but they're making a TV series mm -hmm. uh, on Apple or so on. So that's in the works. So I am blessed with the media and privileged with the media and all the formats of it. And I'm learning it like I'm uh, I'm probably older than you, Dennis, but I'm even I'm <laughs> even learning as an old age lady to do all the techie stuff. And, and, and I like your chapter, Ruth, on just learning the vocabulary, the lingo, 
of the crime yeah. in the murder business. I'm That's sure right. you never knew what a bump was. No, I didn't. I knew a sting, but not a bump. <laughs> and a special shout out. To, what is Brad's last name? Davis, did you say? Brad yes. Davis, and he is he is my brain. Yeah. Uh, Brad could get a PhD in this case and everything he else. Yes, he knows the detail. He is a very, very bright, good guy. And at the end of the day, he's one of the few people I work with that has the good sense to sit down and have a proper martini with me. Very, very yeah. good. And and I'll tell you, uh, a, a news geek like myself, um, Shane Bishop started following oh. me, and he is Keith Morrison's producer, main he producer, is. I believe. And uh, I don't care if Keith's following me, but if his producer's following me, um, I'm excited by that. So shout out to Shane Bishop, the guys behind the scenes that are uh, doing a lot of the uh, heavy lifting. Uh, back to my geekiness here, uh, Dennis. So I um, I work for a woman named Fran Allswang. Shout out to her. She happens to be listening. And uh, I loved her. She was just everything you wanted in a network producer. Uh, and we... Uh, at CNBC, they started a show to compete with A&E Biography, and it lasted about five minutes, but it was called In Profile. And I had I was uh, underneath Fran, and we were doing a, a biography on Muhammad Ali. And I'll never forget, uh, she said for one hour, uh, she was kind of a true documentarian. She said, we need to get 100 hours of footage. Um, for a two-hour dateline, um, how long are you working on a two-hour date line from start to finish? Well, the running time of the show itself, keep in, keep in mind, is 78 minutes after you take away all the stomach remedy preparations and the promos and everything else. So it's it's not two hours. But a show, well, goodness, we started this, Ruth, back when. The first time I worked the Dan Markell case was the first court appearance for Sofredo and the, Correct. Uh, the two guys came up from Miami for their for their show, first, first show at Tallahassee. Um, so, but sometimes uh, we've had stories that it, I, I get on a plane and six weeks later, it's a two hour show is on the air. Then it can be two or three years. It's it just it's it's whatever, whatever, whatever it takes. Uh, my favorite name uh, as part of SCS Nation, Shaquille Oatmeal. Uh, right. Happy birthday, Dennis, from Shaquille Oatmeal. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> That's that is a kick. So one of the one of the you know, the the. Sort of the, the, the other side of all this, which is tough, is we're also uh, profiling a family, uh, the, the Greenberg family, Ellen Greenberg's parents, Sandy and Josh were on. Uh, Dennis, if you don't know the story, it's out of Philadelphia. It's, it's, a, it's a wild story, um, a sad story. She was a school teacher, 27 years old um, in Maniunk, which is a highfalutin suburb of Philadelphia, and uh, she is found dead. Um, the problem is they ruled it a suicide and she was stabbed 20 times, um, 10 to the back of her neck and back of her head Two, a separate autopsy found uh, that two of those injuries came after uh, her heart stopped beating, implying that she was already dead. Um, her fiance is a person that they were looking at closely. It was ruled a suicide. The point I'm um, um, the reason I'm bringing it up is I just had her parents on. And I said, hey, how come you, you haven't reached out to Dateline? And they said to me, um, and this is sort of a sad reality, that there hasn't been any conclusion. Um, it is still um, being investigated. Um, it, it was determined to be a, a homicide initially, then reversed to a suicide. The family is still trying to get answers. And this happened back in 2011. Um, so yeah. that's difficult. Um, what goes on? I mean... Are there well, things that prevent you from doing a show that you wish didn't? I think as a rule, we don't do suicides. I can't remember us doing a suicide. And if the authorities are ambiguous, the, the, the forensic evidence certainly looks like a slam dunk in this thing that this poor woman was murdered. But if, if, if the authorities haven't ruled, if they haven't, if they haven't set a trial date, if they haven't introduced witnesses, we tend to wait. We, we don't jump all the way in. So, it, I mean, if they, if they feel like we're being slow, it's just because... Look, we're in the story business, and the best stories are ones that have beginning, middle, and end. Now, in the Dan Markell case, we don't have Ruth. We're stuck in the in the middle all the time. Yeah, it's it's yeah. the weight the weight of the middle. We're only halfway through this case, uh, in as for most observers. After what is it, eight years now? No, almost nine. It's nine. also it, it's a murder for hire, which there's a lot of uniqueness in the Dan Markell story. Uh, first of all. 
there's there now I'm becoming a lawyer. I'm joking, but there's federal evidence, there's there's state evidence, and that and there's and there's a, a lot of other kinds of conspiracy evidence, which means that this is a case that any academic has a lot of challenges with, and and the public too, and it has certain so many dimensions, both in in the legal aspect, but also in the in the sort of curiosity aspect which is why a lot of people watch true crime. And when we can't take away from that, the sort of the, the true crime entertainment factor and the case is really full of it. So I think that that's another dimension in terms of a lot of the coverage. And in early, in early days, Ruth, I mean, the, we the reporters in the bleachers were very critical of Leon County and Tallahassee. Why are they moving so slow? And there was a fight between the city police and the prosecutors. Also, why don't they go where this is actually going to. We've got to get back to this family. Uh, and, and they seem to be very slow in, in, in doing that. And now that we've saw the evidence from the probable cause affidavit on how complicated a case it was, we didn't know about the FBI stings and the surveillance and the, they were doing all of that stuff and not talking to us. So I, I, I think we, I, I, I wish I hadn't said to Georgia, come on, you know, Georgia Kaplan, why don't you guys get this thing going? And, they just said, wait. There's been politics, too. I think we can't underestimate uh, the big P politics in this case, too, in terms of the readiness factor. Uh, there were certainly uh, some of the law enforcement from day one who were ready to have uh, all the arrests, and there was others mm -hmm. who weren't. So we have, we have this case has every dimension in it. You know, it has all of these uh, aspects of uh, big politics, big players, juror issues, and so forth. So that's a bit of the backdrop as well. And Dennis, you mentioned kind of holding Leon County's feet to the fire and even, uh, you know, asking Georgia Kaplan tough questions. How helpful is it to have a microphone in your hand, especially one with the uh, Dateline NBC logo on it? Oh, we wouldn't, we wouldn't get in the door. We'd be, you know, we, 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 ha we bring some credibility with the logo and we, we have the, the, our fan base behind us, our viewers. So, yeah, I mean, otherwise they would never sit down with us. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a great privilege for me. I'm kind of an introspective, ingrown toenail personality to be able to take a front row seat in these places and, and actually talk to Georgia Kappelman about your strategy. Jason, your lead investigator, who was wonderful, Ruth. Um, By the way, what do, you, what do you think of Georgia? We had her on the show. She is uh, tough as they come. What do you think of her? I'm glad she didn't become a judge. I was afraid she was going to leave the uh, DA's or the state's yeah. attorney's office and, and get a robe, uh, which I hope she does someday if she wants to. But I think she is great. We worked, uh, oh, I think half a dozen stories with Georgia Kaplan. She yeah. is she is aces. Um, and you also uh, you profiled Tim Jansen, a friend of our shows. He's a defense attorney out of Tallahassee. I'm just totally blanking on the case. He's going to kill me and I need to look it up. Real Williams case. The Williams case. Is, is that what it was? Yeah, Mike Williams, and then he was he defended he he defended the person who uh, had uh, murdered, but he got off. Because it was a Bri the Brian Winchester case. Yeah, that's Brian, Brian, Brian but Winchester. he but it's the Williams murder. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. the Mike Williams murder. Shout out to Tim Jansen, and uh, tomorrow night Tim Jansen will be here with Carl Steinbeck and the great John Singer, and they have compiled Carl Steinbeck has a list of at least 125 reasons, and he's no slouch. He's a former JAG uh, prosecutor, 125 plus reasons why Wendy Adelson should be indicted. Meanwhile, Sophia, Lav Sophia Lavish writes, Ruth Mar Markell, I love you and your family. I pray for Dan Markell to get justice. Um, Jen Henry writes, may his memory be a blessing. You are someone I very much admire. And this is one of my favorite comments up to this point. Catherine S. OMG. I love Dateline. This is my all time favorite show. You guys are the best. From Good. The, great. Thanks. Nice to hear that. From the Jersey girl is how it ends. That's what oh, I love. Great. That's how I love. That's what I love about it. Um, So, Ruth, we were talking about fancy fiction and Asian American legal focus, mentor, lawyer. Um, social media has it has it helped uh, your 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 ploy to get justice here? I think so a lot. And first of all, thank you for your your viewers, your listeners as well. There's a lot of support out there, and we are really really very appreciative. It definitely has helped. Even at the time, uh, Justice for Dan 
did a, uh, when we were trying to get the grandparent issue resolved, they did a petition on it. Uh, I've been on uh, Montour Lawyer. Montour Lawyer has been one of the first ones out. He's also now one of the people who streamlines uh, many of the shows in the court and an Asian American. And she's just done a beautiful thing um, last week. In fact, a bunch of tributes uh, to Dan. And of course, fancy fiction keeps us entertained all the time. And uh, so we appreciate all the, all of the group. I mean, I think what's nice now, I think, Joel, you've also now become part of it. There's a little community. I don't know if you know this, Dennis, that mm -hmm. have, they interchange, they we're interwoven. Uh, some of the players have better specialties. Some of them have a unique aspect. But the most important thing is they have tremendous following for the Dan Markell story. And that's where we as a family are very, very fortunate. And uh, Sonny M, and there's some things Ruth cannot talk about, and I'm not sure if this is one of them. So, Ruth, if you cannot say you cannot, please. But she writes, Ruth, can you please file a civil suit, wrongful death against the Adelsons? You would win and be able to see Ben and Lincoln. Those are Ruth's grandchildren. Not sure if you are able to comment, Ruth, but I wanted to put it out there if you are. Well, I'll, I'll just say that I know that it's everywhere, and there's been comments about the civil suit. There is an issue always of uh, timing and, and so forth. Right now, we're in the heart of the arrests. And I think that uh, our position right at the moment is really, let's go the criminal route. And there's always the other situations to look at. So I know this issue comes up. And I think I you know just addressed it and uh, about the civil suit issue. Dcat writes, Dennis is my favorite on Dateline, great at his craft, followed by, is there, from a, era, uh, Asian American legal focus here, is there going to be another Dateline special on the Markel case, followed by this, Dennis, when can we expect the new, the new Dateline episode to air? Well, we have an interview with Ruth that we haven't aired yet, that we did. We taped uh, it. It was taped, and I was full of coughs and COVID and everything else, and thank you for putting up with us. Uh, I suppose our next marker will be the trial of Charlie Adelson, unless there's a development with uh, Mag Bonowitz proffer. I mean, the, the question everybody wants to know, is she going to deliver to put Charlie Adelson away? Will they be able to corroborate that story? Will it meet the burden of proof? Um, if some of those things are, are out there to be talked about before a trial, uh, I'm certainly eager to do it, but I think probably Charlie Adelson stands trial will be the next story. I just want to say that. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm putting, I'm putting pressure on Brad. Now they take the whole show. We we've done a full show, uh, la late last fall on, in terms of the third, uh, the third Dateline episode. Yeah. So I think he has to judge, uh, the timing, which was what Dennis mentioned in terms of what he wants to cover and not cover and when. Um, yeah, and, and we have to deal with our senior editors. I call them the Politburo, and they're the ones that, who are thumbs up and thumbs down on whether we go ahead and do it now or wait. So, it, you know, it'll depend, Joel, on the appetite for the story, which is what you guys are dealing with every day. If the if the drums start beating faster and it's time to come do the Dan Markell story, by golly, I hope we, we jump in, whether we have a beginning, middle or end or not. And Dennis, how many, speaking of uh, the managing editors, how many, how many people are currently working for Dateline? Oh, goodness. Roughly, I think, roughly. I think I'd, I think I'd lose that pub quiz. I think there must, we used to be something like almost 300. I think now West Coast, New York, I, I think there's probably, I don't know, 120 of us. And someone, had, someone who was hearing my voice say that is shaking their head saying, no, you're way off. But uh, sizable numbers in New York and L.A. And uh, that's a difference, friends, between YouTube and uh, the network. There's three of us uh, working on this and 300 working on Dateline. So there's there's a difference. But uh, Baby Doll writes, I actually watched two specials about Dan today just to remind myself of the details. The absolute nerve to change those babies' names. Wendy, time is a ticking, followed by Marie Hernandez, who writes, she's a friend of the show, Dateline, thumbs up, followed by... Don, who writes, I like the two hour date lines are the best. I just watched one last night just to my mom thinks I'm crazy. I'm like, I'm going to watch true crime to calm down and uh, relax. So she doesn't get it, but I do. Uh, and that's all that matters. Um, Dennis, um, Steve Kappas was sort of a mentor of mine. If you work yep. at NBC, you know him. Um, he was the president of NBC News. And he once described news as a 
like a creature or a giant bear that you can't quite get your arms around. And my first job was uh, an AP associate producer at MSNBC. And to this day, I've almost, I, I still have trouble figuring out news cycles, how news cycles start, how they finish. Um, how do you describe news, the entity to someone who would jump off of Mars and say, Dennis, what do you do for a living? What is news? How, how, you know, what is a news cycle? It's only going to be 22 minutes plus commercial. So how much are you going to get? I mean, that's been the reality <laughs> since the Camel News Caravan in 1953. It's not if you want the news, you really need to go to The New York Times. I'm sorry. You can you can you can see the video version of the, we, we offer, but you're not getting all the news all the time uh, and, and the banners and all the rest of it. I find a lot of the stuff frankly, unwatchable anymore. So I'm happy to live in my my little cubby hole and do my stories. We, I can wrap my brain around it. I can understand who, who, who's out there, how we tell it, what the structure is. But uh, I can't imagine programming a cable news operation right now. And uh, Dennis is uh, officially retired, so he can say that and breathe easy. And I love the fact that he is saying that. Um, Dennis, why do you think there's this massive appetite that it can't seem to be filled even for true crime. There's an absolute true crime explosion right now. What do you attribute it to? The stories, the stories are emotional. They, they, they excite us. Um, and, and you watch and you say, thank goodness that didn't happen to me. I think that drives a lot of it. And I think the fan, I th the, the, if you, if you, if you asked who's watching it, I'm surprised that it's mostly women. I think I think there's a lot of guys that are dragged to the couch because their wife wants to watch Dateline. But I think women are absolutely fascinated with true crime. And I think it's because they share some very dark suspicions about the nature of men. And a lot of these shows kind of validate that. Um, but uh, I, I, I don't know. It's always been out there. I, I remember being in my jammies and watching Alfred Hitchcock Presents, which wasn't true crime, but it was crimes and mysteries and thrillers and it's always been there and it's always been a very popular genre and then you get guys like keith and josh doing a fine sand to it and it's 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 irresistible a uh, law rn writes oh my goodness i walked in the room and heard a dateline voice dennis murphy well done <laughs> followed by dateline channel on peacock 24 hours a day followed by new york patriot lady ruth we are with you followed um no oh, let's throw this one in nisha mac wow this channel is legit they have such uh credible guests how do they do it the secret sauce rhymes with meve moen his name is steve cohen he is my partner in crime and just like dennis and just like keith and just like josh mankowitz he's a great producer and he gets me great guests like ruth and dennis so we appreciate that uh ruth this is a topic obviously that's difficult for you to Talk about, but one I know that's near and dear to your heart. Jimmy C writes, the grandkids are also true victims, Danny's boys. How is that, all that going? And do you want to tell uh, STS Nation a little bit about everything you've been able to accomplish in regards to grandparents' rights? Yes, thank you. And I think that that's a really big issue. The grandparent alienation is a very, very huge social problem. Uh, they even have something like anonymous, people don't realize it, alienated grandparents, which has its own uh, sort of groups and following and chapter meetings and so forth. Uh, we were successful in, uh, in actually getting the Markell Act uh, passed on uh, June uh, 24th, 25th in, uh, in um, 2022. We, I have the opportunity to thank, and here's my, my time where I give this whole community of people uh, really, it started with with Karen Karen um, Halpern Ciphers. I don't know if you know this, Dennis, but they created a full full uh, community to work with the legislatures. We we had lobbyists and so forth. It takes a village, and we got this piece of legislation passed in uh, June uh, of 2022. It was very very important. Uh, we also had a visit with the grandchildren. Uh, in April of uh, 2022. 2022 has been a good year for us in this horrible story. And I actually saw the grandchildren 
in December of this last 2022. So we have moved a little bit. I would just say that there's a crack in the door. Mm, I'm uh, happy it, to hear that, Ruth. Yeah, thank you. It's a big step to just to be able to say, uh, you know, they know our faces. The other thing that I did do as well, because Shelly has three adult children. They're already in, the, some of them are graduating university in engineering. And I wanted them to have a chance to see the faces of their cousins. So we had a Zoom uh, for both um, Benjamin, the older boy's uh, birthday, and, all, and also for Lincoln, uh, who's the younger one. So we've been really like trying to keep that, that sort of uh, door open. It's, it's challenging. I also want to say, and, and this is very important, there has been a lot of people who actually wrote me uh, through Facebook Messenger and others that how they uh, have circumstances where they need to use the Grandparent Act. And there is something that's been developed in terms of um, how people can go around uh, using the legislation. And they also could uh, contact um, myself or Karen, Karen Halpert Cyphers. Uh, the other thing that Joe had a program, I don't know if you know this, uh, Dennis. So these are the, the sort of uh, big supports that we get. We had a, a program with the uh, with uh, Leitner from MAD, from uh, Mothers mm -hmm. Against Drunk Driver. Yep. And that was amazing because she, so all of us are trying in our own ways uh, to do some advocacy. So you have this trauma and either you're going to let the trauma pull you back or you're going to move forward. And I now have uh, a term that I use. So we all know uh, post-traumatic post stress. I talk about post-traumatic growth and post-traumatic change. And so that people who've gone through loss can really look at, you know, there is a way to start to get to the other side of the fence. My new thing that I'm doing and very excited in terms of advocacy, I'm working with uh, some of the school shooting victims. There's been 94 cases to March the 5th of this year of incidents related to shootings, not all school. And so I'm meeting with a fair amount of the uh, families and some of the psychotherapists and, and social workers to really help families uh, go through some of the school shootings because they have the parallel to the homicide survivor, which is what we are. Um, Sherry's News writes, Dennis Murphy can see you are the excellent journalist you are with how you express <coughs> yourself. Followed here by Marie Hernandez. Love the way Dennis Murphy tells a story. Watched him many years. Enjoyed the journey. Followed here by Angela. Dennis, thank you for being so caring and delicate towards Ruth. You're a legend with a kind heart. And Dennis, this question follows. Um, how does getting to know uh, a crime victim like Ruth inspire your work? I think Ruth is one of the bravest people I, I know. Just the, 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 idea, the idea of going to the Florida legislature, which is a, as fractious a place as you could ever hope to engage, and, and to walk this tightrope, there's an awful word here, and that's leverage. Her grandchildren are controlled by a woman. The court of public opinion thinks the family has, has, has killed her, her son. Uh, you put it, prosecutors believe, you can put a lot of ledge, but it is believed that uh, the Adelson family is behind this thing. And yet, they have custody of those two children and can cut Ruth and Phil and Shelley off at any time if things aren't going well. So that Ruth, that's a terrible tightrope you've, you've had to walk over the years. And I'm glad to hear now that you've been able to keep it open and you're uh, having actual visits and Zooms and whatever. Thank uh, you. Sunix or Sunix writes, Ruth, my son had Dan for class at FSU. We have followed the story in shock and sadness since day one. It is an honor to be here with you tonight. You have set the bar for graciousness high. That just gave me the chills a little bit, knowing that uh, her, her son actually had Dan as a professor. So um, you can see it comes full circle. These are not uh, fake stories. This is not fake news. This is real news, yep. real people, yep. real victims. So, um, Dennis, to you, and, and we're going to – I can't uh, – over by my time here with a with a guy like Dennis and a woman like Ruth. So we'll wrap it in a few minutes, but a few more questions to get to. Um, in your opinion, Dennis, what makes this case really stand out from other true uh, crime stories that you have covered? Because you've obviously covered so many. People that should have known better and went ahead and did it anyway. I mean, it's just incredible 
this egregious crime, killing this distinguished guy. Uh, I mean, Ruth, I hate to say it, but as a crime story, not your fate and what you've been living through, but it's got everything that an outsider wishes to indulge in and look over the shoulders of the investigators and prosecutors. It's a great police procedural. It's a fascinating in trial, in courtroom case, and not all of them are. But this is just, it's, it's just great. And, 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 and Ruth, we're only halfway through the story, I think. You know, we still have another act or two to go. Uh, we'll, we'll see. But it's just, it's just got all the elements. I think that I, I just want to say thank you. And thank you to all of your, the comments on, uh, that are coming, coming through. I, the, the case does have the glitz and glamour part to it. There's no question about it. And the trial and the fact that it's a murder for hire has even more. We're not dealing with one trial, one hearing and so forth. This is the hard part on the victim. I don't want to tell you that this is glitzy at all, because this is where we really suffer, where it could have been, you know, one experience. And then afterwards, we would have some some completion. So I think that that is the real part. And I and I want to make sure that um, all the time when talk about the victim experience, that that people have that sensitivity uh, to people who are suffering. And, and all around us now, I mean, if you're a young person, I'm going to speak in the university in a couple of weeks. And one of the things is it doesn't matter if you're in teaching, in education, in, in medicine, if you're in law, you're going to confront today, unfortunately, it's tragic, some of these victim experiences from the school shootings and, and the, high rate, the high rate of murder. Um, Angela writes, and this is an important shout out here. Karen Cyphers is a gifted writer with a kind heart and humble. She deserves props for her amazing advocacy. Seeing her in the courtroom always reassures me that the media is covering the case well. Ruth, uh, people don't know who Karen is necessarily behind the scenes. So if you can tell SDS Nation about Karen Cyphers, who deserves a, a lot of credit. Well, Karen, uh, first of all, has a lot of expertise. She happens to be... Um, I, I call her in a minute. I'll come back to the to my relationship with her. But she also is now an owner of Sax Media, which is very big in Tallahassee. It's a very big firm. Before she was a partner, and uh, Ron Sax, who was the principal, actually allowed or provided for uh, some of his key people to buy the company. So she has a high profile. She also worked about uh, seventeen years, I believe in the Tallahassee legislator, and I probably don't know, should have a curriculum vitae in front of me, but I don't. And and more specifically, she does do a lot of writing uh, in some of the court uh, documents and court articles. And she's been phenomenal as a support to the, the Dan Markell family. And not just in uh, the support of the grandparents, I have to say that Karen and, and Jeremy Cohn and a few others have organized on Dan's 50th birthday. It's amazing what they've done for all these memorials continue. And this is really, we didn't talk about informal, which we really should, this informal support. They don't forget, uh, you know, each anniversary, the birthday, and they have had events in the park, fundraising. I mean, this is, um, this is all spontaneous. And I think that we really have to acknowledge this big, big community of which uh, many of the listeners on the show are, uh, of all this magnificent outpouring of support. Jen Jen writes, amazing work, Ruth. Your grandsons will be so proud. Followed by fancy fiction, Karen Cyphers is a hero, period. Followed by orange jumpsuits, Wendy and Donna from Giovanna to Stefano. We'll see if that, if that actually comes to fruition at some point, uh, Dennis, two, three more questions and we're done. Are there any aspects of the case, uh, that you feel were not adequately explored or explained during the trial or subsequent media coverage? It's a big question, but just wondering if there's anything that jumps out at you. Well, I had some in the weeds questions about how this why it was so slow to get off the ground. That would be dealing with the p politics of the former state's attorney there, Megs, and uh, why why it took so long to get going. But I, I see now that it's such a complicated case. Um, I, I think I'm just looking forward at this point. I want to see if they've got enough to make a case against Charlie. Is there going to be more than the love, uh, the, the Dolce Vita enhanced audio? I thought that was good, but is it enough to get a conviction? Is it beyond a reasonable doubt? Will Magbonawa deliver? Will she 
will her proffer have uh, verifiable facts that will get uh, Georgia Kappelman a conviction of, of Charlie Adelson and maybe lead to more uh, uh, charges, more indictments? Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward rather than where we've been. This thing is not over, way not over. Shelly T writes, wonderful show, Joel, hashtag best guess. It is not just a tagline. It is a reality here on STS Nation. We do get the best guess, as you can see right now, with Dennis Murphy and Ruth Markell. Uh, Ruth is so proud of Danny. Imagine how proud he would be of his uh, mother. Dennis, has there been a story um, where you have gotten just emotionally attached, where you didn't want to, but it would just hit you so hard, uh, where it's hard not to detach yourself I, I i usually step back and look at them as kind of intellectual puzzles to solve how are we going to tell this how are we going to structure this but i gotta tell you i was we were doing a cold case in greeley colorado and i was there was a little girl who was abducted from her home after a christmas concert and it was 40 years ago and we went out with the homicide detectives to this bald plain and it was crusted with snow and they said the two detectives, this is right where we found her. And that, it, it, it all came through. It was almost, I think, that what you felt when the unveiling of the, the gravestone happens, where you see it, and it's concrete, and it's there. It's been an abstract that this this poor Janelle has been missing since she was 12 years old. And all the while, this was where she's been. It was just, that one, that one got to me emotionally. Mm. Uh, for those of you who don't know, who've been living under a rock, Ruth Markell is the author of the very widely read and discussed book about her son's murder, The Unveiling, A Mother's Reflection on Murder, Grief, and Trial Life. Again, it is called The Unveiling. If you have not ordered it, you can do so on Amazon. Uh, prior to writing that, she was already a noted author, public speaker, and the president of RNM Enterprises. And I can tell you, because Ruth and I have become friends. She's always working, always hustling, and always doing the right thing. She's also appeared on every network show imaginable, and I assume will continue to do so for the foreseeable future. Uh, Ruth uh, helped set this up, so big thanks to you, Ruth, for doing this. This is a thrill for me to have Dennis on uh, our show here. Any final thoughts from you? Uh, if I could, I'd keep Dennis for 24 hours, but I can't. But final <laughs> thoughts, Ruth. Well, first of all, I, I have to say that in all this uh, horrible trauma that we've been through, uh, I, I have two words to describe my life. And they're very simple words. Trauma, there are three words maybe, trauma and gifts. So the trauma of the Dan Markell murder, the loss of the children, uh, visiting the grandchildren for quite a few years is terrible. Now I have all these gifts that have come around in the years uh, since we've had uh, Dan's death and murder and so forth. And a lot of them relate really in this case uh, to the media, the support of the podcast, the support of the community, the Tallahassee community, and really all your viewers and listeners and everybody continues to be there. And there, you know, the, the word gratitude is in style today, but I don't use it freely. And I am very, very, very grateful to all of this kind of support. K.H. Walker writes, don't mess with mama. My favorite uh, Ruth Markell saying is don't get lost in the loss. Tough thing to say, but she's going through it and has been through it. And uh, an interesting distinction, do not get lost in the loss. And she's certainly uh, turning it into as much uh, positivity as she can, uh, despite it being such a horrific uh, story in its nature. Um Dennis, I'd like to end things on a positive note. Maybe you can share something with us uh, that we don't know about, or we would never guess, about you and your uh, your little-known co-workers, Keith Morrison and Josh Mankiewicz. Maybe something that will embarrass them. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> he wants well, to have beer with them. <laughs> I, I have known Josh probably longer than any uh, anyone else in my professional experience. He, we were on a campaign plane. I think it was Walter Mondale. You'll have to Google it. Back in the mid '80s, and Josh was the kid across the aisle from ABC. He was probably, I think he had an, an 11 o'clock curfew at the time, but he was very young, and I was the I was the young guy with NBC. So I've known him forever, and it's been a thrill to finally catch up again and both be on the same show. He is he makes me laugh out loud. He is the one guy that I, I, I just I, I I can't keep it inside. He's 
he is he's a funny wonderful guy and keith is great when you're in keith's company you feel like you're you know with Cary grant <laughs> Uh, for those of you have, who have been living under a rock, Dennis Murphy is the winner. Is it four national Emmys or more, Dennis? Well, I think there is. I have four downstairs, but I didn't buy one. They, they made us buy one. So I think <laughs> somewhere there is a fifth one in a, in a, in a lockup somewhere. I think it was five Emmys. There's, there's probably a lot more. He's, and by the way, G Giovanni Stefano here pointing out that Keith Morrison is Canadian. Frankie Fig says... I remember Mondale. I remember Mondale myself, actually. Um, again, so Dennis Murphy, he's won five national Emmys. I will correct that. Best known for regular contributions to NBC News, NBC Nightly News, Dateline NBC, The Today Show, and NBC News at Sunrise. And he's covered the Dan Markell uh, murder case from the beginning. He's now a contributor to Dateline NBC, officially retiring, retiring from the network, but still working as a contributor on select episodes like the Dan Markell murder. Dennis, what are you doing in your retirement um, for fun? I, I think I have a week of retirement coming up in July. <laughs> <laughs> well, enjoy it. It's, uh, been, it's been very busy. Joel, thank you very much for inviting me on. And Ruth, it gladdens my heart to see you so well. You really look and sound great. Thank you so much. Okay, well, we're we're looking forward to that next show. And I'm sure me you're going to have a lot of followers and listeners uh, from tonight's episode. And we will let everyone know when the next Dan Markell two-hour Dateline episode is on. Special thanks to both Ruth Markell and Dennis Murphy. We're doing another Dan Markell episode tomorrow night, 125 plus reasons why Wendy Adelson could be indicted and it could happen soon, according to Carl Steinbeck, a former military prosecutor. Until then, love you, America. Thank you. Love